When South Park debuted, it both changed and challenged the boundaries of network television with its envelope-pushing sense of humor. Not even two years later, creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone set out to do the very same for featured films, proving that animated movies could be more than the happy-go-lucky Disney films that dominated the genre. And we're here to check out just how they did that. Hey everyone, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator, and today we're going to take a look back at 107 facts about the South Park movie, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut. South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut centers around Stan, Kyle, Cartman, and Kenny going to see the new R-rated Terrence and Phillip movie, Asses of Fire, which expands their vocabulary in a way that ignites the fury of Kyle's mom. She begins a war against Terrence and Phillip's home country, Canada, for soiling the minds of America's youth. The central theme behind Bigger, Longer, and Uncut is the danger of censorship and the importance of free speech. It's also self-reflective of the reception that the show had received at that point in time, both positive and negative. The film was directed and co-written by series co-creator Trey Parker, though his most notable success at the time was the South Park TV series. The film Bigger, Longer, and Uncut wasn't his first time in the director's chair. Having created the film's Cannibal the Musical and Orgasmo, pre-production for a South Park film began as early as midway through the production of South Park's first season, way back in 1998, with Comedy Central being very confident in the show's success. The reason the studios pushed for a South Park film so early was to cash in on the South Park phenomenon while it was still hot, explaining that the film Beavis and Butthead Do America wasn't quite as successful as Paramount wanted it to be due to the fact that it was released several years into the show's run. The film's creation was part of a contract Parker and Stone had signed in 1998 that required them to create episodes until at least 1999, which also granted them a slice of the merchandising royalties within the show's first year. The contract also stated that that the creation of a feature film would result in an unspecified seven-figure cash bonus. Parker and Stone were personally dissatisfied with the quality of the second and third seasons of the show and thought the series would be cancelled soon. The duo decided to take this supposed last hurrah as an opportunity to do whatever they wanted, and what they wanted to do was a full-blown musical. The decision to make the film a musical was also a jab at the Disney Renaissance era that ran from 1989 until 1999, a period during which Disney films mainly consisted of musicals, making the style seem obligatory for the feature-length animation genre. The the film was a joint production between Paramount Pictures and Warner Brothers due to the fact that Comedy Central, the home channel of the TV series, was owned by both studios' parent companies, those both being Viacom and Time Warner. Though Viacom gained full ownership of Comedy Central in 2003, the transition didn't relinquish full ownership of the South Park film franchise to Paramount. Warner Bros. retained the right to co-produce any sequels until 2013 when WB gave up the rights as a part of a deal to co-produce the Christopher Nolan film Interstellar. Paramount pushed Parker and Stone to aim for a PG-13 movie in order to make the film more accessible, even showing the duo a chart of how much more money a PG-13 rated film could make than an R-rated one. The rebellious creators stated they wouldn't work on a South Park film unless they went for a hard R rating. The season 1 episode, Death, served as a huge influence on the film's script. In Parker's own words, quote, After about the first year of South Park, Paramount already wanted to make a South Park movie, and we sort of thought this episode would make the best model just because we like the sort of pointing at ourselves kind of thing, end quote. Trey and Matt used the movie Beavis and Butthead Do America as inspiration inspiration for the film, but not in the way one would expect. While fans of the Beavis and Butthead TV series, the duo was personally disappointed by the film, seeing it as more of a feature-length episode of Beavis and Butthead instead of a project that could stand on its own. They wanted bigger, longer, and uncut to be its own thing. Many of the staff members that worked on the film were also simultaneously working on the third season of the series, resulting in extreme scheduling mishaps that led to multiple changes being made to the film as close to two weeks to its release. The movie's artists used a multiprocessor, SGI Origin 2031 multiprocessor, Origin 2000 serves with a whopping 1.1 terabytes of storage for both rendering and asset management. In layman's terms, this means the backgrounds, characters, and other items could be saved separately or as fully composited scenes, with quick and painless access to the assets later. Bigger, Longer, and Uncut was the first ever feature-length R-rated animated film to be created using computer animation. While not 3D like Sausage Party, it was created using, well, computers. The film was created using 3D alias Wavefront, Power Animator software running on Silicon Graphics 02, and Octane workstations. Characters were designed with texture mapping, and shading resembled the 2D paper cutout stop motion that the series was initially founded on. Parker and Stone intended to fill the film with as much vulgarity as possible as a means of revenge towards the MPAA for giving their previous film Orgasmo an NC-17 rating. Bigger, Longer, and Uncut would constantly get the NC-17 rating from the MPAA, with the association frequently requesting that they remove key elements to give it an R rating, which Stone and Parker would do, only to replace the content with even more vulgar content. Matt and Trey claimed that the 
MPAA rejected the film's original title, South Park, All Hell Breaks Loose, due to a policy that MPAA allegedly had that all films must have a G-rated title. According to MPAA spokesperson Richard Taylor, this was a blatant lie, claiming All Hell Breaks Loose was never a potential title for the film while they were involved. According to Trey Parker, the film's title is a dick joke that went way over the heads of the MPAA. It wasn't until after the film was released that the association put two and two together. The film originally opened with Saddam Hussein being executed via electric chair, but was cut for how gory it was. One part of the scene survived, which is the response to the question, quote, any last words? This instead was given to Philip as he and Terrence are about to be executed toward the end of the film. He says, how's a boot get me the fuck out of this chair? How's that for last words? The original idea for the internet video of Cartman's mom involved her having sex with a horse off screen, but the MPAA rejected the idea due to bestiality, even though the movie features a picture of a man having sex with a horse. When they pitched the idea of a German man taking a dump on Miss Cartman, they gave it the green light. Originally, Winona Ryder was supposed to shoot ping pong balls out of her vagina as the joke initially suggests, but the creative team was forced to make a bait and switch joke by the MPAA, resulting in her hitting them with a ping pong paddle by her crotch. Conan O'Brien originally pulled out a gun and shot himself in the head, but the MPAA rejected that method due to the recent school shooting at Combine High School in Colorado. There were plans to originally feature a scene that took place in a concentration camp located in the town. Kyle would have been issued a yellow star for doing well in school. Kyle's brother Ike was originally meant to accompany the boys on the battlefield as is seen in early trailer footage and promotional screenshots, but his role was cut down for pacing. The attic scene was added in at the last minute to explain his absence. As a punchline to the Operation Human Shield joke, every male character except for Chef was meant to die in the war, with all of them being revived by Satan in the end. In the final cut, the only casualty is Mr. Garrison. In an earlier draft of the script, it was revealed that Cartman's favorite snack, Cheesy Poofs, were actually a Canadian product and therefore banned in the United States, much to his annoyance. Kenny originally had to get Snacky S'mores' as proof of purchase in order to get his wish granted by Satan. A remnant of this subplot remains in the movie when Kenny's ghost asks Cartman for Snacky S'mores. Wendy originally went on multiple dates with Stan to go see Terrence and Philip, only to get bored with both the movie and him, claiming that the movie was the only thing they really had in common. The film was screened for the MPAA a total of six times before they gave in and granted the film its R rating. This was mainly due to a plea by an unnamed Paramount exec who stated that making drastic edits and animation is really expensive. The last cut the studio screened for the MPA was given an NC-17 rating, which caused an unnamed Paramount marketing executive to call Stone and Parker and tell them that they quote, needed that R rating. This prompted Matt Stone to call and freak out on producer Scott Rudin, which in turn prompted Rudin to call and freak out even harder on the MPAA. The next day, the film was given an R rating without any alteration or reason. The original trailer for the film took tasteless jabs at Walt Disney and the Disney Animation Studio, something that really angered Parker and Stone, stating it was quote, everything we didn't want the film to be. Paramount took the songs from the film to create a music video that aired on MTV, which had all of the R-rated elements cut out to appease standards and practices. Paramount sent the tape to Parker and Stone over a weekend for their approval and needed it back by the following Wednesday to air it accordingly. Furious by the edits made, Stone threw the tape into the trunk of his car, an action that almost provoked Paramount into suing the duo. Much like the opening of the show, the film's credits tell us that the celebrities parodying the film had no involvement or endorsement for their portrayals. Among these mentioned are Conan O'Brien, Brooke Shields, US President Bill Clinton, Winona Ryder, and the Baldwin brothers. While the celebrities in the film weren't portrayed by their real-life counterparts, some of them were played by other celebrities. The Baldwin brothers were played by Canadian comedian David Foley, while Minnie Driver lent her voice to the film's iteration of Brooke Shields. While Gregory was primarily voiced by Trey Parker, his singing voice was courtesy of Broadway actor Howard McGillian. McGillian is perhaps best known for playing the Phantom from Phantom of the Opera longer than any actor in the show's history. All members of MAC, Mothers Against Canada, were played by actress Mary Kay Bergman, who voiced practically all of the show's female characters throughout the first three seasons. Bergman unfortunately passed away not long after the film was released. A few soldiers in the film were played by famous musicians. One US soldier was played by the police drummer Stuart Copeland, and a Canadian fighter pilot was voiced by Nick Rhodes of the British band Duran Duran. Dr. Gouache, the surgeon that fails to save Kenny, was played by Hollywood actor and director George Clooney. Clooney is a huge fan of South Park and previously voiced Stan's dog Sparky in the episode Big Gay Al's Big Gay Boat Ride. George Clooney as Dr. Gouache is a reference to his role of Dr. Doug Ross on the TV show ER, which he played for 108 episodes. When he removes his hood at the end of the film, Kenny was briefly played by Mike Judge, the creator of iconic adult animation like Beavis and Butthead and King of the Hill. Matt and Trey collaborated with songwriter Mark Shaman when creating the film's iconic lineup of songs. Shaman said that the work he did on the movie was the most important gig of his career, crediting it with getting him work as a musical contributor on the Broadway musical Hairspray. The establishing song Mountain Town is a parody of the opening number of Disney's Beauty and the Beast, Belle, both in the music and choreography 
of the scene itself. The song Uncle Fucko was originally titled Motherfucker, but the wording was changed to achieve an R rating. Parker and Stone stated that this is one of the few times the MPAA's meddling actually made something funnier. Shaman devised the fart tap dancing break that occurs during Uncle Fucka. He asked South Park Studios for their entire library of fart sounds and spent hours listening to them and arranging them in a way that created tap rhythms. When the orchestra of a film comes to record the score, they typically don't want to hear the lyrics of the song in order to better focus their effort, but they will often be open to hearing the playback. Shaman recalls one of their viola players listening to Uncle Fucka in its entirety for the first time and then walking out of the room in disappointment muttering, quote, four years in the conservatory. Blame Canada was the fourth attempt at creating a song for Sheila Brofloski to sing that would clearly convey the film's conflict of the enforcement of censorship. Fourth time's a charm. One alternative idea involved the Disney-esque villain visual in which Sheila would transform into a Maleficent-like character. This was dropped to avoid demonizing parents. Blame Canada was partially inspired by the aftermath of the tragic shooting of Columbine High School in the respect that parents, law enforcement, and the media would try to blame the actions of the gunman on the likes of video games, movies, and music. Kyle's Mom's a Bitch is the only song in the film to originate from the TV series. It was originally featured in the episode Mr. Hanky the Christmas Pooh, albeit shorter. When Cartman shows us how kids around the world sing Kyle's Mom's a Bitch in different world languages, it's not just gibberish. Shaman actually commissioned Trey and Matt's assistants to get translations for the songs in as many languages as they possibly could. All of the translated performances were sang by Shaman himself, sped up. While well, What Would Brian Boitano Do wasn't a song from the original series, it is a callback to the original short from which South Park was birthed. The Spirit of Christmas short involved the boys watching Jesus and Santa fight each other and asking themselves, what would Brian Boitano do? The three-part episode Imagination Land was originally conceived as a theatrically released feature-length sequel to Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, but was ultimately used for the series due to a lack of ideas for episodes at the time. Though initially denied by Paramount, it was confirmed in a 2001 interview with Metallica that the vocals for the song Hell Isn't Good were performed by Metallica's lead singer, James Hetfield. For whatever reason, the song Hell Isn't Good is missing from the film's official soundtrack. It has never been added in reissue shoes either. Eyes of a Child is meant to be a mockery of the pop versions of Disney songs that would often appear in the credits of their feature-length films during their renaissance, like Beauty and the Beast, A Whole New World, and Can You Feel the Love Tonight. Troy Parker and Matt Stone wanted to produce a music video of Eyes of a Child in which Michael McDonald would be on a beach singing with the song projected onto a white sheet, but the studio rejected it. The song Up There was a jab at the seemingly obligatory songs in Broadway musicals in which the characters would always sing about what they want in life. Troy was also inspired by the song Part of Your World from the Little Mermaid. The song La Resistance was inspired by the number One More Day from the musical Les Miserables, of which Trey is a huge fan. Shaman had never seen it, requiring him to study the entire soundtrack constantly in order to get the feel of the song right. Let's check out some movie tidbits you may have missed. First off, Satan has a framed photo of actor Skeet Ulrich mounted above his bed. Ulrich is known for his roles in the film Scream and as good as it gets. In the film's final battle, Cartman's V-chip considers Barbara Streisand a swear word. On the emergency room schedule, Dr. Chermsky's job is to dis disembowel Kenny. In Mr. Mackey's room, there is a poster that reads, Get High, on poetry. This is based on a quote that was said to Matt Stone by one of his high school teachers. The exact quote being, Son, you need to know not to use pot as a natural high. Instead of getting high with pot, get high with poetry. The pianist that appears during Big Gay Al's Super is modeled after the film's co-songwriter that we've been talking so much about, Mr. Mark Shaman. The doctors replacing Kenny's heart with a baked potato is a reference to the song Spadoinkel from Trey Parker's film Cannibal the Musical, which contains the lyrics, my heart's as full as a baked potato. Contrary to popular belief, the film was never banned in Iraq. Paramount actually never made any attempt to release it there due to its portrayal of their leader, Saddam Hussein. According to a pie chart that appears in the film regarding the Canadian economy, most of the country's money is made from Terrence and Phillip, the snowball machine, tourism, the log industry, pornography, and filming the X-Files. Among the flags outside the United Nations are a skull and crossbones pirate flag, as well as a rainbow flag symbolizing gay pride. One of the black soldiers in the film blurts out, used to think West gonna die Die. This is a reference to Jar Jar Binks from everybody's favorite Star Wars film, The Phantom Menace, which was released very close to Bigger, Longer, and Uncut in May of 1999, making this a very quick response in true South Park fashion. On top of screening Asses of Fire, the movie theater is also showing the films Mecha Streisand Takes New York, The Milk Song, and Rat Kicker. As we've stated in our 107 South Park facts, the show's creative team likes hiding the alien visitors from the plot in various episodes. And the movie is no different. One can be seen on the dollar bill handed to Conan, while others can be seen in a photo frame in Cartman's room. Also, a final one can be seen within the crowd during the reprise of Mountain Town. The film contains 399 swear words because the MPAA had told the filmmakers that had they included 400 curse words, the film would have received an NC-17 rating outright. The 399 curses are just another middle finger in a long line of middle fingers directed at the MPAA. 
okay. When the boys are watching the Miss Cartman porno video, the stop button on the toolbar is replaced by an obscene drawing labeled sphincter. Throughout the film's 81 minute run, Stan vomits a total of five times. Kyle's mom's organization, MAC or Mothers Against Canada, is a spoof of the real life nonprofit organization known as MADD or Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which seeks to stop underage drinking and drunk driving while also supporting those who have been hurt by such actions. The film contains an after credit scene featuring Kyle's younger brother, Ike. Unlike most post credit scenes, this one appears after the closing corporate logos. There is a framed portrait of former US Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall on the wall within Mr. Garrison's classroom. Marshall is noted as being the first African American justice to serve. The end of the film credits the characters with performing the film's musical numbers, not the actors who actually portrayed them. Real crew members are listed as writing and producing them though. After three full seasons on the air, the theatrically released film marks the first time Kenny's unhooded head was revealed to the audience. At the end of the film, Saddam Hussein is credited as being played by himself. In reality, Saddam is played by Matt Stone. The film opened first in the United States on June 30th, 1999 and raked in over 14.7 million during its opening weekend alone. The film grossed a whopping 83 million worldwide by the end of its theatrical run, making it the highest grossing R-rated animated film of all time, a title that it held from 1999 until 2016 when it was dethroned by Sausage Party. Due to the controversy surrounding bigger, longer, and uncut's R rating, the MPA began backing up their ratings on posters by providing explanations for why a film is rated the way it is. Due to the backlash received over South Park's theatrical release, the president of the MPAA, Jack Valenti, has gone on record as saying he regrets granting the film an R rating instead of an NC-17 rating. During its theatrical run, there were numerous reports of underage children purchasing tickets to the PG-13 Will Smith flop, Wild Wild West, in order to gain entry into South Park bigger, longer, and uncut. Legendary film critic Roger Ebert gave the film 2.5 stars, writing that it was the year's most slashing political commentary. In his review, he also stated that it was too long and runs out of steam, but it serves as a signpost for our troubled times. Just for the information it contains about the way we live now, thoughtful and concerned people should see it. After all, everyone else will. Bigger, Longer, and Uncut achieved 81% on Rotten Tomatoes' Almighty Tomato Meter, with the critical consensus being that its jokes are profoundly bold and rude, but incredibly funny at the same time. Bigger, Longer, and Uncut was named the sixth greatest animated movie of all time by Time Magazine, beating out other animated classics like Toy Story and Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Monty Python member Terry Gilliam placed the film on his personal list for the top 10 animated films of all time, something Stone and Parker must feel very proud of since they are such big fans of Monty Python's Flying Circus, which was a big inspiration for South Park. Comedian Chris Rock cites South Park Bigger, Longer, and Uncut as the funniest movie he has ever seen, stating to this very day, no movie has ever made him laugh so hard. Parker and Stone screened the scene of Conan O'Brien's death in the film for the man himself on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. O'Brien responded that his interns found the scene hilarious, but were quite annoyed by the fact that the late night set in the film is at the top of the GE building when it is in fact on the sixth floor. While most celebrities targeted by South Park tend to respond with outrage and lawsuits, Brian Boitano saw the movie and responded to his inclusion with appreciation and laughter and referred to the musical number as surreal. As mentioned in our South Park 107, while Matt and Trey did not require permission to use Brian Boitano's name or likeness for the film, Brian Boitano required their permission to use the phrase, what would Brian Boitano do for t-shirts Brian Boitano was selling for a charity event. South Park was honored at the 2000 Academy Awards with Blame Canada being nominated for Best Original Song. Unfortunately, it was beat out by Phil Collins' You'll Be In My Heart from Disney's Tarzan. The song was to be performed live at the Academy Awards, but ran into trouble with ABC's Standards and Practices Department, which demanded that the song be altered to be more TV family friendly. Shaman commented that that action was ironic given the fact that the film, as well as the song itself, was about censorship. Blame Canada was performed live at the 2000 Academy Awards by legendary comedian Robin Williams. Albeit a bit altered for the network, despite this, Matt Stone stated that he was pleased with Williams' rendition and was impressed by the production value. Trey and Matt showed up to the Oscars in dresses, with Trey wearing a replica of the Versace dress Jennifer Lopez wore to the 2000 Grammys, while Matt wore a replica of the pink Ralph Lauren dress worn by Gwyneth Paltrow at the 1999 Oscars. Years after they attended the Oscars, Stone and Parker claimed that they also took acid before the show and were essentially tripping out the entire time. Though Parker and Stone felt that they had no chance of winning the Oscar for Best Original Song, they were both shocked and offended that they lost to Phil Collins. They responded to this personal tragedy in Season 4 by ridiculing Collins for two episodes straight in Cartman's Silly Hate Crime 2000 and Timmy 2000. The original DVD release of the film was somewhat scrutinized by the public, as the only bonus features it offered were three theatrical trailers. This was due to the fact that little to no documentation of the film's creation exists. The film was even released on the infamous Laserdisc format in January 2000. It has since proved
proven to be an extremely rare collector's item. Bigger, Longer, and Uncut earned itself a spot in the 2001 edition of the Guinness Book of World Records, taking home the record for the most swearing in an animated film. Besides containing 399 swear words, it also contains 128 offensive gestures and 221 acts of violence. On their The Mark, Tom, and Travis show tour in 2000, Blink-182 would often end their songs with lines from the film song Uncle Fucka. This can be heard on the live album of this tour. Illinois-based wrestler Evan Galestico of the Lethal Wrestling Alliance has used the rock version of What Would Brian Boitano Do as his entrance theme music. He claims it's his favorite song he's ever used. Trey and Matt watched the film for a second time in 2009 for the commentary track on the Blu-ray re-release, only to admit that neither of them had any recollection of creating the film due to their hectic work schedules. Upon watching the movie again, Trey and Matt regretted not having Butters appear in the film as he would become one of their favorite characters over time. Butters didn't become a prominent character on the show until after the film was made. Once again, I'm Justin, and thanks for watching 107 Facts About the South Park Movie. What's your favorite part of the film? Would you want to see a sequel? Comment down below and let us know. Don't forget to click that little bell icon to become part of the awesome notification squad, as we have new videos dropping every day, so make sure to subscribe to Channel Frederator, your cartoon central on the internet, and never forget, Frederator loves you.